Turn with me to Isaiah 44, 3. I'm not doing the message I put in the secret place. That was how to pray in the spirit and pray in understanding how one leads the other. So what you do is you go, and while you start praying, you start listening, and after a little while, your mind will quiet from its intensity of whatever and start getting quiet, and soon something starts to bubble up. Uh, you might be led to a scripture. You might be uh, drawn to a, a vision, a dream experience. Then from there, you begin to explore. Your understanding increases what you're seeing, and then you get to a point where you have to continue into the spirit because your understanding can't uh, really uh, go beyond where it's stuck and your spirit just expands and you go higher and further in and in and out and in and out. It's wonderful. And I pray that you're, we will do this for the next two, three weeks. We have three weeks to, con to the conference, to power. Three weeks to the power conference. Three weeks from tonight, we will begin. If you haven't registered, I encourage you to set apart the time. Make it a set time that you're setting apart to be with God. I promise that as you do that unto the Lord, the Lord will respond to you in like faith. He is, he's, he's worth it all. And when he calls us apart, he asks us to trust him and that he'll prosper us in the absence of work and absence of other things. And he'll prosper us in our journey in the kingdom. But... If you don't set the time, often you will not be able to find the time when it comes close to the day. And the whole week can go by. People miss the whole week and they thought, well, I didn't even know we had a conference. So make the choice, pray, and then start praying in tongues and praying in your understanding. How many could use more power? Me. Right? There's many fillings of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm personally, I am very much in the dialogue. It's going something like this, Holy Spirit. You are the means of the manifestation and the witness of Jesus. We need you desperately, more so probably than ever in the history of our lives. We need you to come. I need you to come. I need you to be big. I need you to manifest and, and, and witness Jesus Christ. And I am just here anticipating with expectancy. That's why I wait. That's why I pray. That's why I'm pressing in. Two weeks from today, we're going to do a church fast. <clears throat> That'll be the 27th. We'd love for you to join us. The sanctuary will be open from 6 in the morning. You can be a part. Come in. Be quiet. From 4 to 6 p.m., we'll have corporate prayer, and then it'll just lead into the service 7 o'clock, and we'll go further into uh, pres pres presenting ourselves and positioning ourselves to receive with faith and encouragement. Amen? Yeah. Come on, you're gonna, you know what? It may be the 50th time you've heard this, 50th Pentecost you've been to, but why not just put it all in again? Yeah. You know, why not believe again? Yeah. You know, Elijah prayed and shut the heavens, then he prayed again and the heavens opened. It always is prayer. Precedes what new things come. So I encourage you to do that. We do prayer every Wednesdays now from 4 to 5 p.m. if you're free. Make it a point. Join us. And we are doing a lot of praying in tongues and a lot of praying in English. We're just kind of moving in and out so that we can pray with our understanding, pray with our spirit, sing with our understanding, sing with our spirit. So in the prayer meeting today at about 10 to 5, the Holy Spirit just downloaded what he wanted me to talk about tonight. So I'll, I'm going to talk about it. Paul had a son. And how... The Holy Spirit coming always touched generational awakening and how the, the awakened generation must, pro, must journey so that the next awakening can come to the next generation. In other words, you might think that you're sitting here and we need the young people to come alive. Opposite. We need to get into our victory so the young people can come alive. Amen. Yeah. The awakening of the generation of our children fully into their fulfillment and that represented generation will come through the completion of our assignment and the victory that we come into in that assignment. And it's not a competition because we're together. There always is a son, father, son relationship. So I went to, I'm just going to go quickly. You will love this. And I think at the end you will be uh, 
charged like I got charged in those moments with God. Isaiah 44, 44, 3. There. I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. When you get thirsty, say you've been out, you know, working out or just, do you ever think to yourself, what a sinner you must be? You know, the fact that you're thirsty again, as though you shouldn't, you had a drink of water yesterday, it should be fine. Have you ever got hungry and got, oh, I, I, you know, that's terrible, I shouldn't be hungry? You know, it's a healthiness creates thirst and hunger. So I will pour water on him as thirsty. He isn't a sign of a decrepit, dying person. People, most people that die, die of, of lack of water. They go into a lot of, you know, when the end time of your body shutting itself down, it stops to function. To be thirsty means you're alive. In other words, so, so don't look at, oh, I'm thirsty for the Holy Spirit. It means like, what's wrong with you? It means you realize there's more than what you got. I will pour water on him who's thirsty and floods on the dry ground. <laughs> Just let's imagine that three weeks from now. Imagine that three minutes from now. You know, I'll pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. So whenever the Holy Spirit comes and we could go to Acts 2 and we'd see the same promise in, in Joel that when he pours out his spirit, it's our sons and daughters will, will prophesy, our young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. You see the generations. You see an activation awakening of multiple generations. But it's not that one generation got it and they got the other generation to get it. It's the Holy Spirit came and made Jesus real. Holy Spirit comes, Jesus gets real. We don't really care how old we are or how young we are. We want in. All right, so if you think it's all, I don't this, it's not that, it's just no Holy Spirit. It's just, we need more Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need more of you. We make it known that we as Jubilee Church welcome your coming, uh, whatever crazy way you want to come, whatever extraordinary way you want to express yourself, however you want to reveal Jesus, we need you. We cannot do it. What we're doing is not sufficient, but what you have is all sufficiency to manifest Jesus Christ. You have all the gifts, all the anointings, all the abilities. We welcome you. We need you. We put, go on record of seeking you, and for the next 21 days, we're crying out, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, manifest in a fresh and powerful fashion in our lives. Not just us in this room and those online, but generations now. Generations, generations, generations come alive in the Spirit, as you come. Amen. And they will spring up among the grass like willows by the watercourses. One will say, I'm, of the Lord. I'm the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. So there'll be a multiple manifestation, multiple uh, manifold uh, expression, not all the same, just all of a sudden starts coming to life, like, like spring flowers out of in, in a prairie or in the middle of the desert in the spring or in the tops of the mountains when the snow is finally melted and the sun has made the grass grow, and now all of a sudden you have these wild flowers. Yay! Yeah. Let it be. So let's, look, let's go to Philippians 2.19, because now we've got to go to the encouragement. I would believe that a lot of us got swept into something like that. Got swept up by the Spirit of God flowing and going and growing and we came alive and we said yes and so here we are now 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years later and we're holding our place but we're wondering how do we get to the next place. We're going to let our thirst come alive. We're going to let our hunger be seen and we're going to continue collecting ourselves inside of what is already what God has spoken. So look at this in Philippians. I want you to see it because I believe it will really powerfully encourage you. Philippians chapter... How do you know where I'm going? Did I say it? Oh, okay, I should just read my notes. Forget my... I like the Bible. I mean, I... All right, I'll just go with that. Philippians 2.19. But I trust the Lord Jesus... 
to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Imagine Paul, he's in prison, Roman jail, one of the last letters he's writing. He wants to send Timothy because he wants to be encouraged and encouraged. And Timothy, he says he has no one like Timothy because everyone seeks their own, but not the things which are Christ. Imagine how long it takes God to perfect a saint, to worthiness, to functionality, to love, to caring for others and themselves. We, 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 we just did the mansions monthly meeting. Go online and please pick it up. Get on it. It's, it was really powerful. But, but one of the things is that in the preparation stage, it is just us learning to hear his voice in an opposite setting and grow inside the sound of his voice. And the one hard thing to get rid of is self. Because self just seems to like have a self-preservation mode. That's just like on auto. You know, it's just ready to stop any intrusion. And so did you hear the song we were singing about creation's going to obey and, 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 and creatures are going to obey, creation's going to worship, and we're going to surrender. That's our, our life journey. So Paul sending Timothy, he says, you know his proven character at, that as a son with his father he served me in the gospel, therefore I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me but I trust in the Lord that I may also come shortly. So this is a statement of Paul concerning his son, Timothy. Timothy is now vital, valuable uh, reproduction of Paul, a reawakening of a sound that Paul grew up in. Now Timothy's carrying it. So now go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. This was written, I think, sometime before. This is... uh, Timothy in his training mode. Timothy is given time to be in the church to help raise up elders, pastors, get things in order, keep, and, you know, he's young in his, he, he's, he's found in faith, and his father was a Greek, so Paul circumcised him so that he would have more reception amongst the Jews, and then he took him with him, and then he left him, to begin to nurture a region of churches. And in chapter 1, verse 3, Paul's exhorting him by saying, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. You know how long it takes to do that, verse 3? I mean, it takes Jesus to me give you the pure conscience, but to live inside of that that process is like why things move so slow. You know, we can't cut corners in the kingdom. We want to go... You, you think the knowledge of tree of good and evil is a shortcut. It's the long way around. The right, you know, and so he says, ah, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, And I'm persuaded is in you also. Paul had the ability to see beyond the situation as it as it presently stood. Could could go back to points of origin, and connections, and value the journey that was building to a a great climax. And I believe we're in that. Every one of you, every one of us, have been in a journey prepared by heaven. It's not been as pretty as you wanted it to be, and a lot of things happen you didn't expect to happen, but the journey has been to see this faith in you come forward. And that faith is more precious than anything in this earth, and it is the part that we are, that continues us to run the race. So therefore, Paul says to Timothy, I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So we all want the Holy Spirit to come. I desperately am thirsty and hungry for his manifestation. One of the things I know to be true because of Scripture, and Paul now exhorts Timothy, is to receive the new, you've got to reawaken the old. You've got to get the old back alive. Have you prayed in tongues? Pray in tongues again. 
If you've prophesied to yourself, get in the spirit enough to prophesy again. Get some place where, you're, you're, you, where that which was put into you, imparted to you, spoken over you, given to you, experienced in God, comes back alive. This is really important. At the last verse of this, you'll see this is exactly everything about our journey is the appearing of Jesus, the experience of Jesus. So I want you, I'm reminding you, Timothy, stir it up. Stir up the gift of God that is in you that was given to you to lay it on my hands. So yeah, evidently, gifts that are given never leave. Things that were imparted to you 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 minutes ago are forever with you. Gifts and callings, no repentance. So get it back alive. And, and we, raise up, uh, we raise the water level. We get our, our prayer life going. I, I don't know yours. I know mine. You know yours. And that which God has given us, we want to cause it to come back alive. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's what comes in place of that which grace once was, fear. It makes us timid. It makes us kind of get safe, calculated, not sure. And I only can imagine what Timothy has gone through as trying to pastor this group that Paul drags into the kingdom. And here he is, says, hey, he's, you've got to not, the reason the gift's not flourishing is because you're, you're getting caught in self-consciousness and fear and timidity. But God gave you a power, and he gave you love, and he gave you sound mind. So I believe, you know, when we pray in other tongues, we, our spirit is, being, is praying and we're being edified. And I think that's if you're, I can, when my mind is not working, and knowing how to pray, I know it's time to pray in the Spirit. Not, not like, you know, just, just more intentionally give more language of the Spirit because I'm obviously stuck up on my understanding. So i got to get the Spirit praying. And when I'm in the Spirit of God, I will find that righteousness, peace, and joy, and you'll find power, love, and a sound mind. Okay? Our little grandson, shy, doesn't really like to... Um, he's started preschool. Yes, yesterday was the second day. And he was like, I don't want to go. And, you know, he just, he just didn't want to go. I want to go to Costco instead. <laughs> Who wouldn't, right? <laughs> you got to go somewhere. Let's go to Costco. And um, so I'm sat him on my lap, and I'm saying, okay, Noah, you just, first thing to do is get quiet. Because if you get quiet, the fear will get smaller. And he, you know, he's both in the stubborn, resistant mode at the moment, wanting to think that if you flail and fight, you could stop what was coming. But you also kind of know from your own experience that things are coming, so you're trying to find out how to get there. And I'm giving him some advice. Get quiet. Quiet yourself. Quiet yourself. We are told to quiet ourselves in love, in his love. So as he got quiet, I said, now begin to anticipate something wonderful that's coming, which your mom said she's going to do with you after you get out of school. Um, just place your hope forward. It's not forever. It's, not a, it's just a morning. And, and so you could watch his little... You know, it wasn't like it was just snap happy and, okay, I got it. It was coping mechanisms. Most of the kingdom, until you get victory, is just coping mechanisms. Right? Let's be honest. I mean, the devil doesn't go away because you did 12 hours of resistance. He goes away when you never, when you, he doesn't, when you, he can't bother you. Do you understand that? He does not go away because you met some quota of training. He goes away when you don't need him to train you. <laughs> you don't need the opposite to demonstrate the truth. The truth has become so substantiated that the opposite is no longer even an issue. You've overcome. So the coping mechanism is the, what we're being given, what we've been imparted, spirit and truth, words, life, and we're holding them. So when we move out of the spirit of fear, the timidity, and get ourselves into the spirit, power, love, and a sound mind begin to manifest. The power Holy Spirit, the dunamis, the love, the agape, the, 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 the confidence, the, the security, and sound mind where we can think again, think clearly, think better. And that's what was, Noah was 
submitting to. And, and you just had to sit there. And you'd be surprised how powerful that is in, in the presence of God, just to sit and just, just settle, just kind of sink into God. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of your Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So Paul's not mincing words. Timothy, it's not, it might be tough now, but it's getting worse. We're going to go for, through more stuff. The stronger are going to bear more infirmities of the weak. Who saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace with which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So we are saved and called. Say, I'm saved. I'm, saved. I'm called. I'm called. With, a holy calling. with a holy calling. Not according to my works, to my but, according to purpose, purpose, but according to his own purpose and grace, and grace. which was given to me in Christ Jesus before time began. We are not just trying to find our way. We are in his way. We are in Christ moving forward set in the beginning before time, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Wow. So, let's go back and look at Timothy's life a little bit more. There was, before the second letter, there was a first letter. 1 Timothy 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse um, 18. This is, we don't see a lot of this mentoring father-son relationship in the, except with Paul, so we get some, glean a lot. I charge you. I charge, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith of suffered shipwreck. Pro prophecy, words of encouragement, scriptures that came alive, anything that activates future, then engages about a war. Promise attracts problems. And the only way out of the problems is through the promises that were given to us that attracted the problems. So we're in a kind of a catch-22. If we back out, we lose our place and go further back. But if we, if we go forward, we're liable to feel more pressures than we felt if we were just trying to back out. But he says, I want you to uh, fight the good fight. I, you have a uh, you are given these prophecies. You can wage a good warfare with them that will help you in the battle. How many, don't you, a prophecy you think, oh, that's the future. And I just went through that. Now here's where I'm going. No, it's usually where you're going into. Yeah. And that's the battle you're about to experience, not the one you just came out of. But it's so you know that you're going to come through it. And then the thing is, what happens is in the midst of all that, we can throw away our faith and we can shipwreck. We can lose our conscience. We can just back away from, from being present before God, working with his promises while we're in the midst of our problems, trying to sort out how he's speaking these words when we're seeing these things and we're moving. He says, keep doing it, keep doing it, because Himaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So, we can go into a place, the pressure could get so great, that we just say, I'm out of here. I, I, I'm, I'm stopping, I'm quitting, I'm taking a vacation. And the problem is that the, really the only other course that that leads us to is just more bondage, more captivity, more struggles. And it, they weren't like being punished, they were learning. So you're learning stuff. Learning by what you're going through is why you, how you're growing in your obedience. How you're learning to hear is by what you're going through and what you're hearing. So let's, fa let's flash forward. Uh, chapter 3, verse 12. So he's just exhorting Timothy. Uh, chapter 3, verse... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. No. Four. No, 4, verse 12, sorry. Chapter 4, verse 12. Let no one despise your youth. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example of, to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. 
those are places to meditate. How's, how do I live in an example to believers in these areas? Till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. If you start to stagger in your faith and your promises begin to become eclipsed and you're shipwrecking, you will n no longer value reading the word, exhortation of the word, or the teaching of the word. It just becomes like, well, what does it matter? It's not making the difference that I'm trying to get to. Don't, but instead, don't give attention to it. Stay in the word. Stay in the word. And don't neglect the gift that's in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. So if I'm hearing from the Apostle Paul to the son Timothy, he's saying to him, you've got words being spoken over your life and they're valuable and they attract war and they're how you win the war. And yet the word of God in general is very important to continue to submit yourself into. And you just got to give attention to this. That's what we do in prayer. Give attention to what God's given you. Give attention to practicing prayer and speaking in tongues and declaring promises and growing in scripture. And, and uh, meditate on these things. Meditate. That means the mutter to, 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 okay, God, what were you saying to me when you said that? What does that mean now that I heard that? Where is that taking me? I thought it was taking me here. I'm over there. I, I thought it was going to be in two years. It's 20 years later. Converse, have the conversation. What does that mean? We're going to have a marriage ministry, but now I'm divorced. Ask the hard questions. Don't be afraid. God already knows who you are. You know, you're not informing him of anything he doesn't know. You're opening the conversation to learn what you don't know. Because his word is beyond our circumstances and eclipse our failures. Meditate on these things. Give yourselves entirely to them that the, your progress may be evident to all. So though we may not be accomplishing what we want to accomplish, there is progress if we give ourselves to these things. The word, prophecy, the spirit. We move forward. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. It's funny, you have to take heed to yourself. We all do. We all have to say, wait a minute. Am I faking myself or am I holding myself to where God is asking me to? How do I take heed to myself and to the doctrine? How do I live honestly inside of the scriptures and honestly to myself? And how do I pull myself forward? Continue in them. That's why going to church is a smart thing. It's the smartest thing anybody can do because we get in the presence of God with other believers and God comes and he starts to swirl and move about. Next thing you know, we're all being encouraged to go forward that we could have easily talked ourselves out of at home. That's why we provoke one another to love and good work. So continue, continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You see, not only is our life try, meant to advance, there's others that are going to advance because we advance. Or there's others that are going to stop because we stop. And we have to recognize that, there, that this is not just for me. Just as Paul had a Timothy, Timmy had a, there was somebody behind Timothy. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he doesn't just come to just create, you know, an Irma. Just a, a hurricane, flood, destruction. He comes to bring life. And, and, and how he does so is he prepares a people. He says, you guys live with me. Now for a concentrated time, pray for pray. And when I come... You will have been prepared by me, and you'll just know what to do. Follow the Holy Spirit. So verse, uh, now let's go to chapter 6. This is where it gets hard. And this is what God spoke to me in Israel this year, February. So it's obviously keeps coming back to me. It's a, it's a posture of the right before the closing of the season of death to the season of resurrection. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. <clears throat> Paul speaking to Timothy. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Again, those are not commandments. Those are experiences, places to partake in. 
to drink of God, the godliness of God, the likeness of his godliness inside of me, the faith that he gives, the love he gives. Fight the good fight of faith. See, the reason the preparation is done in this process of suffering inside of the voice, the voice of God creating trouble and the trouble contending with the voice of God that we've heard, the promises and the problem and the conflict, is it's a battle, it's a faith, it's growing. And in the midst of this, we're supposed to keep choosing. I'm, in, I'm a grabbing eternal life. Eternal life is to know God, to know Jesus Christ, to have an honest relationship, which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now watch this. So we have... We're not a, we, we let everybody know, hey, I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus. We, we're com- we actually support each other in that, con- in that confession. We told others who weren't supportive of that. But he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to, the, to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. So if you're going to get an idea of where confession is going to have ult- in heaven, it's celebrated. On earth, it's word over. In heaven, it is your confession of hope. Here on earth, it is that thing that, that hell's trying to disconnect you from, that which God spoke over your life. And Pontius Pilate was not somebody supporting Jesus. He was contending with Jesus and who he was and why he was here and what he was doing. So don't you, we have to expect, we're not going to have the circumstances supporting what God has spoken of for us. You see, this is preparation for an out, um, outpouring of God, not, not the, the effect of the outpouring. Okay, the outpouring will sweep everybody. But those who get swept in will have to learn up what you have to learn. So why don't we just submit ourselves to learning what we have to learn so when he comes we can help others just go fully in it. In other words, he says, you're gonna, you've got to hold this like Jesus did. He held his confession. He, he, did not, he was not moved from the conversation Father and he had carried through life even as he faced imminent death, which he could have delivered himself had he just said a few right words. Take heed to the commandments without spot, blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. You only have to hold your confession until Jesus appears. That's the good news. Problem is, you don't know when he's going to appear. So you have to set yourself that you may be holding a conversation in agreement with Jesus for some time. And he welcomes an honest conversation back, but he doesn't like to be accused of not caring. So we learn, how, we learn to approach our husband correctly. We don't just accuse him or threaten him or, you know, we just kind of move toward him like, you know, I'm, I really, you know, a lot of praise. Man, I always like that. Oh, you're just awesome, Jesus. And I'm trying to figure out how awesome, how a person is so awesome. You know, you, you, know, you just try to get a conversation. You're telling him he is who he is, what he said he is, is doing, and will accomplish what he put in place, but you're having a hard time holding your place. And he welcomes that. Because you'll say, well, then let me help you come back into my place. Because evidently, you and I, like Martha, have left the good place. And we're busy, 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 busy. Freaking out. Looking around. Nobody else is helping us. Blaming everybody else. And he's going to say, come on over here and sit. The only thing that's really important right now is to just sit with me and hear my words. And, and again, the quieting. Okay, let's go to chapter t- Timothy chapter Second Timothy chapter one. Now you we can appreciate verse six and seven even more. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God that's which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So we can see Paul has been coaching Timothy that this is going to require you really getting a center. You're going to get, really have to get centered and have a place of communion and union and agreement and keeping alive the things that have been given to you supernaturally and value them and submitting yourself and holding yourself in the larger sound, the word of God, 
and carrying the prophecy and being in the spirit and not letting fear and timidity back your way. So now jump with me to chapter 3. Um, verse 12. Paul's wrapping it up. So am I. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. It matters where you learned what you learned, the outcome of their faith. You must continue in these things. And, and so you've got that, that path that God sets you on a journey in modeling and following and listening and growing. But then there's also all scripture. Oh, and, oh, and excuse me, verse 15. And that from childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Scripture is to introduce us to Christ Jesus. The Scripture does not save us. Christ Jesus saves us. That is a simple, we have to understand that, because it's not the law, although that would be Scripture just without Christ. It is that the Scripture brings us to faith in Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's why the whole Bible is so valuable. We have to love the whole book, allow God to lead us through the book and grow in things we hear. And it's profitable for doctrine, for the largeness of sound, for reproof, to get a hold of my attention, for correction, to help to redirect the way I'm thinking, responding, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is what's happening right now. This is what we've been growing up in the last 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, five, 5 months, right? Nod your head. You, I'm not, you know, it's not going to get worse if you say yes to me, all right? It's like, not, you know, that, don't, that's that timidity thing. And I know that timidity, trust me. I am well, if, you know, I've sang those songs. I let the wind blow and I go, never again do I want the wind to blow. Then I dry up like a fig on a dirt, and I'm willing for wind to blow again. Man got equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Last scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 8. I believe there's more Pauls in this room right now than Timothys. And, there's, and you may go, well, I don't really know who would even follow me if I was to find where I was actually trying to go. Trust me, there will be somebody. There's people watching you all already, trying to sort out. They can't figure out why you don't quit, why you keep pressing in, keep moving forward. And yet you know that you can't because there's no place else to go. God has the words of eternal life. You're hearing life. You've got to follow. So here's Paul now. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Okay, guess what? That's, our, that's what we get to look forward to, drink offerings. You know, drink offerings means your life just gets wasted at the end. At the service and sacrifice of someone else's faith, according to Philippians. Paul used that same phrase and explained it. Just, I, what, 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 what am I trying to collect anyway? I'm leaving this planet. I got a better place. I, I'm already being poured out. God's just going to pour me out now. For the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. See, Timothy, fight that fight. I fought that fight. You're fighting that fight. Everybody's got to fight that fight. Nobody gets in without fighting the fight. Faith is a fight. It's a good fight because you win. But it's a fight. It's a wrestling. It's a struggle. It's a holding a place of agreement. I have finished the race. That's the important part. You've got to finish the race. I don't know where your race ends. I know where my race will end, and it's not here yet. So I have to keep moving. I can't be in that assurance. I hope to have that same assurance that Paul had and Peter had, that it's about time to be ending. But if you're not getting that, you may be wishing for it. <laughs> God, please. But if you're not getting that, it's only one thing. Just keep the faith and keep moving. I have kept the faith. You, that's, the, that's the war. The war is over your faith. They came by the word. The word, is, the word brought faith, and the word, he's trying to dislodge the word and remove the faith and shipwreck you. And then you will be, you know, there you are. Finally, 
there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. That's going to happen to each and every one of us in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I decree it over us that we will be there and we'll look on there and we'll see that there, we've, we recognize each other in that crowd and we will be given by the Lord, the righteous judge, a crown of righteousness. Because it's not just for Paul who will give it to me on that day and not only to me only, but all who have loved his appearing. Don't ever stop Jesus from appearing. Don't ever deny him access to all of your apps. Let him in. And when he comes in, then move with him again. And stay engaged. Let what he's given keep alive. When you find something's going dormant, get it back alive. Stir it up. Grow it up. Let the hunger come back alive. Let the thirst come back alive. Let the imagination come back alive of this glorious one coming. Because that loving his appearing means the loving of the manifestation. It's where we get the word epiphany. Did I say that right? Good, thank you. Close enough. Close enough. Don't ask me to say it twice. (laughs) It's that appearing, that encounter, that experience. When you go to pray tomorrow, in the name of Jesus, I decree that you and I will each have an epiphany an experience, an appearing. Jesus Christ will appear and he will remind us of who he, what he said and what he's done. And he won't change the conversation and if we need to, let's activate the stuff that's gone dormant. Don't go try to make it happen, just agree with God that it will happen. It's hope. It's not faith in what he said, but hope in that he's going to do it. Do you understand that? You, can, it, you have to have faith in what he said and hope that he's going to do it. Hope is not seen, therefore you have to live in the confession of hope with him. But gosh, that's the end. That's the end. It's worth it all. Not sitting in church or not owning a million dollar home or losing everything. It doesn't matter. That is not the end. The end is here. Loving is appearing. Receiving the crown of righteousness. Poured out into our our life. Poured out. Yeah. Be diligent to come. Let's stand together. Now I'm gonna, I pray that the Lord would just charge each of us like he started, Paul started with Timothy, I charge you, my son. And wherever we are in the journey of like Timothy's life, we would quicken to the words of the Lord. If there's a scripture that you've heard that came, just really, really caught your attention, that's probably a place to go back to in prayer tomorrow. Because there's probably something there that there's a, an awakening moment, a renewal moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, we began spontaneously by asking the Holy Spirit to come. And we acknowledge that we need Holy Spirit. Jesus, you told us we couldn't do anything without the Holy Spirit. But then we heard in the word of the Lord that we are to value what the Holy Spirit has already said and already given. So for that, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, I know that in my own life, I have despised things you gave me. I actually thought they were curses, burdens, unjust things to carry, troubles that they brought upon me, struggles that they put me in. I ask you to forgive me for that, whatever. It wasn't about me in the first place. It's about your son. I ask you to give us the courage to move back into the stirring up of the gift, into the love, into the joy, into the power, into the sound mind. I ask you... Holy Spirit, to help us see what we've forgotten and what we've let fall down and what we've neglected and where we've not done the diligence that we know that you're asking of us in your word and truth and so forth. Lord God, we want to be like Paul. We want to end this with the appearing, with a love of appearances of Christ and a crown of the righteousness that was given to us by faith in which we live in hope for. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we have 21 days. It's not that those are any special number. But may you give us these days to move forward into the encounter, into a 
recalibration on every level so that our thirst will not be of someone who no longer values water, but of someone who is enjoying a lot of water. And our hunger will be out of a healthy, I need more because there's more being asked and so forth. In the name of Jesus, to every one of us online, here, live, on, in the sanctuary, who watch later, I ask that you, Spirit of God, would help calibrate us and we would respond and we would take hold of the stuff you've given us and waken those up and prophecies would come alive and, and gifts would come back and function and we would move into the spirit and there would just be incredible renewal. Some people would even think we've already been touched by what was coming and we'll say, no, we just got a hold of what we've already been given. And then, in the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit upon all flesh on that new level of fullness and break open a generation to come back alive to who they are in Christ. Call them out of their darkness. Call them out of their stupor. Call them out of their confusion. Call them out of their wherever they've been and pull them back into an awakening to name themselves under the banner of the radical, glorious Jesus Christ. We declare this now. Pour out your spirit. There will be prophecy. There will be tongues. There will be dreams. There will be revelations. There will be visions. There will be signs in the heaven. So let it be. So God, we say yes. We say yes to what you're asking us to do. We say yes again to what you spoke to us. We say yes. If you told us 20 years ago, it's still real. If you gave it to us 40 years ago, it's still ours. So we stir it up. We activate ourselves back in until we fulfill the race and finish the course and pour ourselves out. But in the meantime, we declare, Lord, rise up this level of, re of people so that you could then pour out your spirit in this next move of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Yes. <laughs> great. All right. We'll see you Sunday. Have a great night. That, go in that prayer.